God, Almighty Father, we give you honor, praise, and glory tonight. As we step here into your presence, we pray the gift that we might behold the beauty of your Son. And Holy Spirit, I need you. I ask you to do the work that only you can do. Open the word to us. Reveal to us our hearts reveal to us you as you point us to our Savior. Lord Jesus, be glorified tonight in this brief time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Part of that was hard to watch. But compassion was beautiful to watch, wasn't it? We looked at this morning, one of the blocks of mission is control. And most of us, I think, are very aware that it is easier to be in a relationship where we are in control. It's how we protect ourselves. And part of what I'm longing for in the rebirth of mission is that we come to identify that many of us have been in the place of the Laodiceans. We are doing church great. We are doing all the programs and all the things to make everybody come. But Jesus is outside the door. The church changes. We change when he's in control and we're not. And that's the essence of what it means to be under his lordship. And this is what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. His gift, if you look at the end of 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, his gift... Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring us into the presence of the Lord Jesus. To behold his beauty. To follow him, to love him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. That he came for us, we sell out for him with all that we are. This is what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus, that he means everything to us. We behold the glory of the Lord, and the more we're in a relationship with him, the more we are changed, transformed from one degree of glory to another. And he teaches us a surrendered life to give all that we are to him. One of the greatest blocks of mission, one of the greatest blocks in the church, is for us to let go control. And let Jesus come and refresh us in the Spirit. And it just leads me tonight to the second major block in mission. It's called pride. Control, a controlled life, a self-protected life, leads to an attitude of pride. And this is the nature of what you've got in this story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus, in verses 25 to 28, he is speaking with a brilliant lawyer. And this lawyer has got the most excellent exposition of Scripture. He's speaking about the agape love of God, and he's doing a beautiful job of this. He's speaking of the, the love, the agape, and he's given the right answer to Jesus' question. But our Lord Jesus diagnoses the heart. And he realizes that in this man, he knows it all. He knows nothing at all. It's all in his head. It hasn't pierced his heart. So what we preach isn't who we are. And Jesus saw that. And his diagnosis, his diagnosis is to, is to begin to treat him as only a physician would. He doesn't debate him. He doesn't get on that platform that the academics, the scholars would take. No, no. He's not going to deal with him on that platform. He's going to do something that makes this text of Scripture the most difficult, one of the most difficult in all the passages of the Bible for me. He does what most of us don't want to have happen. He takes us to the scene of a trauma. 
I would suggest to you that all of us since Genesis 3 have been traumatized. But many of us know the reality of trauma. And you know how difficult it is to go back to the scene. And yet that's what Jesus wants us to do. He takes us inside the yellow tape, the crime scene. He takes us to this body and he makes us look at it. This is the story as you saw it so beautifully displayed. This man, this man was traveling and robbers came. They ambushed him. They overpowered him. He had no defense, no protection. He cried out, nobody responded. And so they stripped him. They beat him. They bloodied him. They bruised him. Beyond recognition. They left his body on the side of the road, him half as dead. This, this body. Can you see it? Do you recognize it? Jesus wants us to see it. Do you recognize it? For many of us, what it does immediately is put us into the awareness that we are in an unsafe world. We are afraid of the robbers because robbers are everywhere. They've been everywhere since Genesis 3. We live in a world that is not safe, and we've got to do everything to protect. For many of us, the robbers have no faith. For many of us, it's a, it's a, it's a terrifying disease. It's cancer. It's, it's something that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, wants to steal us or those that we love. It's a terrifying accident. It's something that's happened in life. It's culture, it's forces, it's powers that want to steal our children. It might not have a face, but you can feel it. Sometimes the robbers do have faces. For some of us, that's very real. There are people who have hurt us, who have violated us, who have betrayed us at their own pleasure. For many of us, we don't want anything to do with them. Why has Jesus brought us here to this place? He's brought us here for two reasons. The first one is this. Do you recognize this place? This is where testimonies are born. This is where our story begins. This is the story when something all of a sudden in life overpowers us. Have you had that experience when you've come to that moment of your Red Sea and there you are and you've got robbers behind you, the Egyptians coming down, you have the, the Red Sea in front of you, there's no way out and all you've got is a cry inside you, that ancient cry deep inside, the one that spans all the prayers from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It's all summed up in one word, Hosanna. Save us, Lord, we pray. If you've got a testimony of Jesus in your life, you've been to that body. You know that body. You can identify with that body. Because we can feel it inside when you've cried out with your own heart, Lord, save me. I can't. You've been in that place with King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, where you've got the army all around you. And all you can say is, we are powerless. Just as the king said, we are powerless. We don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. That place of that cry is where we meet a Savior. It's that moment of complete and utter surrender in our life that we meet a Savior. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, I'm now found. John 1.12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. Do you recognize the body? Do you have a testimony of Jesus? Do you know that moment when he came to save you? Have you been in that place of trauma? 
where you've cried, Hosanna, Lord, save me, I pray. There's a second reason that he has brought us to this body. I wonder if you can see it. It takes us a little bit deeper. It's not just that this is our story and that he's come to save us, but it's how he saved us. You do realize that after he spoke these words, not long after he spoke these words, that that body would be his body. That he would be broken and bruised and bloodied beyond recognition. That he himself would hand himself over to the robbers. Luke 23, 53 Behold, this is the hour of darkness. This is your hour. He handed himself over to the robbers. He handed himself over to his father. And the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 6 happens. And the father laid upon him the sins of us all, the iniquity of us all. And there in Gethsemane, the blood began to drop as he yielded himself. I want you to hear this, especially if you are somebody who has newly gone through trauma. The reason he has come is to take your trauma to himself. Your shame, your sin, your guilt, your pain, your isolation. He doesn't just come to save you. He comes and came to bear it for us so that by his wounds we are healed. It is only in Jesus that we're going to find that kind of healing. And this is what he does, because on that cross, on that cross where his blood is shed, and he says the words, it is finished, on that cross, little did the robbers know that there would be a sound coming out, This it is finished. He has come to dismantle the robber on the cross of Calvary. You can hear it in the sound of Colossians 2.15. But he disarmed the rulers and authorities. And made a public display of them. Having triumphed over them through the cross. This is the one who appeared to John on the island of Patmos in his suffering. The Lord Jesus in all his glory. So that that John falls before him as a dead man. Because of the glory of Jesus being so full. And Jesus puts his right hand on John. And he says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. He has come to destroy the works of the devil. That's why the Son of God came. And what he does with us on Easter night when he rises in triumph and rises in victory is he breathes into us the person of the Holy Spirit, washing us, cleansing us, and making us alive, making us new in him. Do you realize what happens when that happens? Guess, guess, guess. The agape, the love of God, comes to abide in us. And then on Pentecost, it even gets more. On Pentecost, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. When Paul interprets this in Romans 5, 5, he says these words, hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his agape into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Do you believe that? Do you understand what that means? This means that we have got the power to not only speak and bear witness of the love of Jesus, we are agape ourselves. That is the church. It's supposed to be who we are. Breathing and living the agape that now abides in us. We live. We love. Because he first loved us.
and something happens in the church inside of us. This is not, this is not a doctrine to be preached. This is the thunder of, of Luke uh, 10, the Good Samaritan story. This is the thunder of it. Brilliant lawyer, come and see this. You're not going to hear a good sermon. You're going to watch it in action. You're going to see agape alive. I know you've heard sermons on the Good Samaritan, blah, 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 good deeds. <laughs> it's just not true. This is not a story about good deeds. This is a story about a converted life. And so you begin to watch this Samaritan. What's the difference? He's got agape eyes. When he sees that body, he sees that body. He knows the pain because he knows the pain. He knows the suffering because he knows the suffering. Is that true? Yeah. This is how we, how we know the difference when you've got it and you see it. You're different because of it. He's got a gape heart. Just like Jesus at the end of Matthew chapter 9 when he looked at the people without a shepherd, lost and scattered, harassed and helpless. We need workers, he cried out. And it says he had compassion. And it says, as you saw beautifully displayed, the Samaritan, he had compassion. He makes the brilliant lawyer watch a Samaritan do what he preached, come alive in life. Alive in life. He goes to him, and as you saw beautifully portrayed in front of us, what compassion looks like when it's lived out. The gospel that we preach and how we live come together. Because the Holy Spirit has come to fill us with the agape love of the Father. It's called Pentecost. And here's the key behind it. Brilliant lawyer. If you got it, because you get it, but haven't been changed by it, you don't got it. Are you not tired of preachers who preach a wonderful message and live an ungodly life? Are we not done with this? My wife used to say that the strongest witness to a dying world is a transformed life. He's not interested in the perfection of the preachers. He's interested in the heart. He's interested in what he wants to do inside of us, changing us from one degree of glory to another as we put our eyes upon the Lord Jesus himself. And that's the difference in this story. Lord, have mercy how this preacher preaches Jesus our Lord. Do you see what he does with the lawyer? Lord, have mercy upon him. He keeps going. He presents to him. He presents to him a priest who passes by. He presents to him a Levite who passes by. This is what the dying church looks like. When we do everything inside, Jesus standing outside, and everything is going well, and we have all of our meetings, and then we have meetings, and then we have meetings, and then we have meetings. The dead church is marked by people whose relationships are broken and people don't care. We are watching the church fragment and inside we're watching so many people get hurt. I'm dealing with a lot of people in my pastoral world of caring for pastors. I cannot tell you the epidemic of church hurt that's going on at the present time. We are hurting our own. This is not to be... We are to be the ones who know the pulse speed of mission because our Lord taught us this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. So you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're mine. By this, by what? The agape love of God preached through us and by us because we not only speak it, we live it, we are it. We don't pass by anyone. The American church is a very entitled church. We are a consumer people. I know it. I get it. The job of the preachers is to entertain you. I'm done with the entertainment church. I'm looking for the church where people are actually sold out for Jesus. Um, what they want to see 
What they want to see is the empowerment of each one of us to go out into this world where people are suffering, people are hurting, and not only speak his name to life, but to care for the needs of those who are in need. We are to be empowered as a people. And that's what the Holy Spirit's come to do. It is only the Holy Spirit who empowers us with this agape. We cannot do this in the flesh. We have proved that over and over. I beg you tonight, if you're in broken relationships with people, I want you to bring them to Jesus. If there are people you're isolated, people you've neglected, people you've pushed aside, I want you to name them. If there are people who have done it to you, I want you to bring them to Jesus. I want this night for us to come alive with a, with a willingness to say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I have not prized relationships as you have prized me in your love for me. And so I pray tonight, Lord Jesus, that we receive the agape flow of your Holy Spirit into us. Because we who receive it and are changed by it, we cannot help but give it. And every time we give it, we get more. To give more, to get more. That's the whole heart of it. The essence of mission, freely you've received, freely give. And I pray that you'd empower us to give. And tonight, Lord Jesus, keep our eyes upon you and call us, all of our relationships, all of the people that have hurt us and that we have hurt, Lord, call us to account that we might make all things right before your eyes so that in our day we might see agape reign through us in Jesus' name.